and it's my pleasure to introduce Cisa, whom I just met. So Cisa Pan, I understand from, so we'll be talking a lot about what she's going to be graduating soon, mm -hmm. and what happens next. But let's look at what happens. So Cisa got her bachelor at the um, University of Science and Technology in China, then she has been studying Carnegie Mellon, as you guys probably know, Carnegie Mellon is in Pittsburgh, but has a satellite campus here in the valley. And in fact, if I remember when they opened that, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've ever had many collaborations, but it would be probably an interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, she has, she's has worked on a lot of things related to Internet of Things, of people just computing, and I see that she's been published in a lot of the, in all the best conferences. This year, IPSN, you become, and she got a bunch of awards, including Best Poster Award at Census and IPSN, Best Demo Award, you become, Best Presentation Award at Census and Audience Choice Award. So, very good. So, I'm looking forward to an interesting talk, and let's thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, my name is Shi Jia, and today I'm going to introduce my work on the indoor human information acquisition from the vib physical vibrations. So people actually spend a lot of their time in the indoor environment. In fact, according to EPA, the Americans spend about 87% of their time indoor, on average. Therefore, the indoor sensing system that captures all different types of human information is important for a lot of smart building applications. So what type of human information that we're talking about here? So imagine in, the, uh, in a scenario like in an office, we want to know um, who, the, who the people are in the environment, where they are, what they are doing, or in general for the room level, what's the occupancy count, or like how many people are in the room. So this type of information. So why we, uh, we need this type of information? Because these information are the fundamentals to in enable a lot of um, applications such as uh, in the building, the resources management, the space usage monitoring, and uh, furthermore, more ubiquitously access control. So there are a lot of different type of sensing approaches has been explored. And I'm listing a few here, including vision, sound, RFID, Wi-Fi based method. And of course, every sensing method has its pros and cons, and we are actually uh, comparing four particular aspects here, including sensing requirement, whether, it's a, whether it requires dense deployment, whether people need to carry a device for the sensing purpose, and whether it will cause some privacy concern. So for vision-based method, it always requires line of sight to be able to act. It doesn't require dense deployment, which is really good, and usually don't require people to carry devices. Although sometimes it does raise the privacy concern, and we did have experience that when we try to deploy it in the nursing home environment. So sound-based method, as, as you can see, there's a lot of ambient noise around us. Therefore, to, to allow the accurate sensing for the sound-based method, it usually requires a, a low ambient noise environment, which could be a constraint for, in terms of the sensing requirement. It does allow sparse sensing as well as device-free Say you can, in, in your home, you probably have uh, Amazon Echo and you just uh, call it name and it will respond. And it also has a, a certain level of privacy concern similar to the vision based method. So, on the other hand, for the RFID based method, it does require relatively short distance for the sensing purpose. Everyone needs to carry a tag so that it can be sensed. Although it doesn't really um, Raise a, raise a serious, uh, severe privacy concern, so which is really good. For Wi-Fi based method, um, nowadays a lot of um, Wi-Fi based method doesn't require you to carry a phone. They just uh, have the transmitter receiver 
um, and they detect the people, like number of people who they are um, with the signal change caused by human body um, blocking the signal. It does, um, although it does require an open space to be able to perform with high accuracy and things like that. Doesn't, so, right, let me sorry. Thing. Why do you say that RFID uh, doesn't have probably privacy? If you are touching a card, right. probably your information is on the card, so the system reads that it's you. So that's probably you already, um, like, uh, in general, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really um, give out the information, say, your image or the conversation, this level. Um, it's, identity the identity, if you carry a particular device, you can just program it with a, um, the name you want, not necessarily passively giving out the information directly about you. So we consider it has less, like comparing to vision and sound-based method, it's better in that sense. Yeah, somehow to device free RFID, you're interested in your own feature. Oh, that'd be, yes, that'd be I mean, great. In general, we, we carry a tag. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, in general. And every, every sensing method, like if we dig deeper, there's always pros and cons, and there's always corner case that we are not able to solve. So the, then with all the consideration from the system perspective, we want to ask, how can we sense better? In terms of better, we want to say, can we use less sensor in terms of uh, both number and type to achieve the signal, uh, information acquisition of human? Can we uh, allow ubiquitous sensing that doesn't really require people to carry devices or to wear it all the time? Furthermore, can we allow non-intrusive sensing that doesn't raise as much um, privacy concern as, say, um, vision or sound-based method that, as they do. So our solution is to use structure as sensors. So the story goes back to five years ago at the middle of the night, where we actually doing some structure mo health monitoring for the civil engineering folks. So don't worry, I'm not going to talk about structure health monitoring. I mean, it's kind of boring, I'm sorry. Um, and what happens there is a human induced a vibration, which is for, for the structural health moni monitoring, it's a lot of noise. So we have to do the experiment at middle of the night where less students walk around. But it's a like graduate school, still people walk around at middle of the night. And while we do the experiment, one person walks by, we have to stop the experiment right there. He went into the restroom. And then uh, uh, my advisor came, we talked, like, why are you not collecting data? Oh, there's a person in the restroom. Then the guy came out. I look at the data, and after a while, I'm like, hmm, this guy didn't wash his hand. My advisor is like, how do you know? I was like, you see, this vibration is caused by flushing the toilet. The first step, first step, first step, door. He didn't stop for the faucet. We're like, oh, this guy didn't wash his hand. <laughs> so then we're thinking, what does this mean? It actually means that the structure is sensing the human, its information, even its activity. So can we utilize the structure as a sensor to detect the indoor human information through it? So as we mentioned, we look into this new uh, sensing modality. So if you notice, people, all the activity, even like you twist your um, body a little bit, all this activity causes the structure where you're contacting with the environment, it causes a vibration of it all the time. And vibration actually travels really far in the solid. Then with that, um, if we can capture this vibration, we will be able to indirectly infer all this activity causing the vibration. So if we look back, it doesn't require people to carry devices. It allows a sparse sensing because it travels fairly far. Each sensor for the first step um, perspective, it actually can sense over 10 meters in radius. 
Furthermore, it indirectly infer the information which avoid, say, direct uh, human uh, image or sound recording, which raise less privacy concern. At least uh, the uh, folks in the nursing home now allow us to deploy the sensor. So what's, what's the, how does this system work? Well, all this human interaction, say the first step, the touching on the table or the knocking on the door, all this activity causes the structure to vibrate, either on the floor, table, or door. And if we put the sensor on the surface of the structure, we will be able to detect this vibration through the, after they travel through the structure and reach the sensor. Then, as a lot of other uh, sensing system does as well, we characterize the signal, we do the machine learning, and we get some results. And here, where we utilize the structure to extend the sensibility of the sensor is where we call structure as sensors. And for today's talk, I'm going to focus on first step induced floor vibration as an example. We did have other um, touching or knocking, this type of um, signal analyzed as well, but today we're going to focus on the footsteps. So we build, to, to get that signal, we build some hardwares, we build a lot of different versions so that we can increase the sensitivity of the signal, uh, of the sensor. We, can op we even did optimizing of the hardware based on the historical um, input we get and predict what would be the best hardware setting for the signal to, to be able to get high uh, resolution signal. Furthermore, we designed the system so that it can reduce the structural variation. It can be deployed in the pig farm, it can be deployed in the skyscraper, it can also be deployed in the, uh, in the um, single home in, the ca in California. So let's say we put a sensor on the floor. And when the person walks by the sensor, you'll be able to see, and we actually are, be, are able to detect the first step in the floor vibration. So of course, we did more than that. We actually have a, a few works on how can we detect the first step by adapting to the ambient noise that's changing over time different time of the day, the structure actually reacts differently. We did some work on the how can we collaboratively adapt the hardware setting so that we can always get a high resolution signal no matter where you walk or what type of shoe you are walking in or where, which in, the, where in the building you are walking on the floor. Furthermore, we try to separate the the signal that's, uh, that's induced by human first step from all the other ambient excitations that will cause the structure to vibrate. But don't worry, those are also not noise, like say the vending machine, the open closing door, the dropping of the object, all this contains the information. But here, since we're focusing on, on the human induced uh, uh, vibration, we're focusing on the first step induced vibration, we actually can separate that based on the spectrum characterization. In addition, we, what, what happens when multiple people walk at the same time, right? So that's a common question we get. Like um, when people walk together, their first step induces a flow vibration might mix up together. So we also did some work on how can we detect that and how can we even separate from the time, um, time domain and still be able to extract the human information from the separated signal. So let's say once we get that data, the next step will be how can we characterize it accurately so it will reveal the accurate information. So there are prior works on how can, how can people characterize the vibration, including um, some people use cla classification, where you need a lot of label data, and uh, somehow that also limits uh, what, how, many, uh, how many different characteristics you can uh, determine. 
while other people try to look into um, the relative uh, characteristic between multiple sensors so they can separate in which zone the excitation happens, which we call zone level localization. Although with that, the number of zones is usually limited and it does have low resolution in terms of sensing. And then people, like, well, there are a lot of works in the sound-based method for time difference arrival. So people also look into that with a vibration signal. So somehow they, they didn't get high uh, in, enough uh, accuracy so that it can be applied everywhere. And it does um, show lack of robustness when it applies on different material. And the, the reason, the missing ingredients here is the structure consideration. So when, when I say structure consideration, I mean the how the wave propagates. The wave propagates while it disperses, and the structural, different structure will have its own unique characteristic, which causes a structural variation that reflects in the first step induced vibrations. So all this will cause inaccuracy in the signal characterization from the vibration signal. So let's look at the origin of the, like the um, generation of the signal. What happens when people walk on the floor? So when people walk on the floor, their foot will impact the floor, which will cause a deform of the floor, and the impact will cause what we call um, the wave that's dominated by a really lamp wave. It's a type of surface wave where it has, um, as you can see in the figure on the right hand side, when the wave propagates, the particle move in circles. So this eventually leads to two type, uh, two characteristic of the wave. First of all, the wave is of low attenuation rate, which means if the wave hits the edge of the structure, it will reflect. It won't die down quickly and it'll travel far. Second, the wave, um, the relay lamp wave shows high dispersion effect. So we talked about dispersion a few times. So what exactly is wave dispersion here in the structure? So when wave travels in a solid material, It'll, different, uh, it'll have different frequency components. And all these different frequency components actually travel at different uh, velocities. Therefore, after a while, if the, like say, um, when different uh, frequency components travel at, travels different uh, um, uh, distance, they are superposition with each other again and causing the distortion. So let's look at uh, one example. So when one footstep um, is occurring on the floor and being picked up by two sensors that has different distance to that excitation, you can see the two signal here, it looks very different. So if we want to extract some of uh, the time difference of arrival from these two signal, it will be very difficult because you don't even know which peak should be matched to which other peak. And because they are so different, we cannot just apply, say, cross-correlation to figure out the shift. So how can we reduce this high dispersion effect on the signal? So we apply wavelet decomposition on the signal. Well, wavelet is known to be e efficient um, for the impulsive signal characterization. So we decompose the wavelet into multiple scales, which scale indicating a smaller uh, frequency band. So we select the one scale and the filter the signal on that. And now the filter signal shows, compared to the original signal, way higher similarity. So that's how we reduce the high dispersion effects. Let alone the dispersion. As if you remember, we, we also have the low attenuation rate of the signal, which causing the high reflection effect. 
when the, when the wave reaching the edge of the structure. So how can we further avoid, to avoid the, the effect of the high reflection? Instead of using cross correlation, we use the first peak to estimate the time difference of arrival. So if you, can, if you notice at the tail of these two signal, the, the similarity become lower again. So by, use, in, by using the first peak, we avoid that problem. So we solve these two problems, and we look at uh, how, how accurately can we localize this um, these type of impulse on the structure. So we look into a smaller scale uh, of the structure, um, different samples. We ex actually um, experiment on a few different samples to uh, including the uh, structural variation. We put the sensors at the, age, uh, at the corner of the sensing area, and we investigate 16 points uh, 10 centimeters away from each other on the material. So we first apply the, um, the time difference arrival based the localization just on the raw signal. And as you can see, um, in the figure in the center where x and uh, where x s and the y axis indicating the um, coordinates on the board, the circle is uh, showing the estimate tip, tap location, different color indicating uh, each different location. And the uh, solid line is used to indicating the arrow between the average ta uh, tap location and the ground truth. You can see the arrow is fairly high and it's very inconsistent even for the taps happening on the s at the same location. So then we look at our method, our, after applying the signal characterization we mentioned, the, the estimated tap location for each individual ta uh, tap point shows higher um, consistency. In addition, the arrow between the average tap and the um, ground truth reduced dramatically. In fact, it reduced the six times. And, and, and to be I'm sure I understand, so you do multilateration alteration on the on the time different difference arrival. Right. And the baseline is using like cross correlation or something to measure the, the different uh, without filtering on the oh, yeah. the wavelength filter. Yeah. Yeah. So in summary, we study the wave property and design the characterization algorithm based on that, we can localize impact-induced vibration with less than three centimeter for the tap interaction localization. And we also achieve around 0.2 meter first step localization accuracy when it applies on the impulses that's induced by first steps. So in, for, for what does this mean comparing to the baseline where the uh, signal characterization doesn't apply. It's actually in, in indicating a six to nine times improvement on the localization accuracy. So actually, the, impulse, uh, the impact induced impulse signal is not the only, uh, only type of wave that people, gen human generate in the indoor environment. When you sitting on the, uh, say the wheelchair, you're uh, rolling the wheelchair, you're dragging a chair um, through a hallway, through a room, and furthermore, if you are swiping your finger on the uh, whiteboard, all this actually causes a different type of waves. It's actually a friction-induced sleep pulse signal. And we also conduct the experiment uh, uh, um, on the tracking of that type of, uh, uh, that type of um, interaction. And because it's a different type of wave, we actually apply a different um, characterization algorithm on it. And the details is in our journal paper. And um, in summary, uh, we uh, achieve less than three centimeter swiping or dragging lens estimation and less than 45 degree swiping dragging angle estimation, which indicating three times improvement comparing to when, the, when no signal um, characterization is applied on, on that. 
So with our signal characterization, we get good signal. We get good data. So the next step is through the data with the label from the machine learning on it, and we got the problem solved. So if you think that's the end of the talk, I'm sorry, you have to bear with me a little bit more. So however, the physical world is very complicated. So if you want to have accurate learning or accurate prediction with the model that you build from the label, you're going to need a lot of label because all different sensing scenario will causing the signal has its own unique characteristics. For example, if we are talking about wooden floor in the California versus the concrete floor in the uh, Shenzhen or in the Pittsburgh, they all have different um, they all have different characteristics and they will respond differently even for exactly same excitation. So in, imagine how, how difficult it is to capture everything, um, every aspect of the physical world by labeling things. Physical world of uh, the data in the physical world is really difficult to get because comparing to the digital world, you can get, um, say, search, search information from Google, um, billions of search uh, results from Google every day, billions of likes or photo uploads from Facebook, but comparing to physical world, it's really difficult. Imagine you ask your grandma to walk a thousand of times in high heels, in slippers, so that you can identify her later. Good luck with that. So other than the system perspective problem that we, we mentioned and we say we, we solved, we have a different problem here. We have a data problem. From the data perspective, how can we make the system learn better? And here, when I say better, I mean how can we system learn accurately with very limited, say, initial label data? So the solution I provide here is what we call physical guided learning. So for the next, uh, the rest of the talk, I'm gonna use a learning problem example where we identify people, we identify pedestrians in the building based on the first step induced the floor vibration, the, the cause. So the intuition here, whether uh, the reason why we can identify people just based on the first step induced the floor vibration, the cause, is that people walk differently. So as you can see here, as an example, person A and person B, they, they walk with different form. Person A walk with his center of gravity kept in the middle, which leads to a smaller striking angle of his foot, while person B kept her center of gravity to the back, which causing her striking angle while in contacting the floor really, uh, really high. So as a result, because they are stepping differently, their first step induced the floor vibration looks very different from both time domain and frequency domain. The center two figure showing the time domain signal of the person A and person B with x-axis time and y-axis amplitude. And you can see person A's um, time domain signal oscillates more than the person B's. So as a result, their frequency domain uh, si signal also shows different characteristics. The ratio between the peaks in their um, frequency domain signal are different. The location of the peaks are also different. So now we know different people walk differently and they have different footsteps in use of floor vibrations. So how about the same person? We further ask the same person walk multiple times and we extract the first step signal from the different walking tra uh, traces and we compare them. As you can see, they do show similar uh, characteristics in both time and frequency domain. So as a result, that means 
if we extract these features, we will be able to throw them into a classifier, through some labeling, we will be able to identify them. So we come and back. If you change your shoes, yes. you walk differently. Yes. So that is a problem that actually related to the next uh, part okay. of the talk. So I'm yeah. going to go to that short, very shortly. So we did some experiment. We put one sensor in the hallway. We asked the 10 people walk by. And then we extracted the first step induced vibration, extract the feature, and we throw it in the SVM. So for if we are in if we are increasing the number of the training data we throw in, as you can see with a, um, per, uh, with a blue line indicating, the step level identification accuracy increases. Can you remind me which features you're using again? So we are actually using, uh, in this work, we are using the frequency domain, um, the entire frequency domain uh, of the signal as the feature. On a, on a um, sliding window or? So uh, we extract each first step signal already. Okay. And it's a fixed length of the signal. Then we, um, uh, then we extract the uh, frequency domain of that uh, entire first step induced vibration and use that as a feature. And for each first step, we will have uh, one prediction, and that's what we call step level accuracy. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. And if, um, imagine when you when one person walk along the hallway, he or she cannot just uh, switch identity immediately in between. So if we collect uh, the cons consecutive first step signals, they must be from the same person. So we further conduct the analysis on the trace level accuracy by combining different uh, uh, first steps, say, through the majority vote to figure out who exactly that is. And yeah. The, the, sorry if I ask you, so, but in the features, then you don't have the, the first step rate because you're just looking at a, at a short frequency form of uh, around the first step, is that correct? Yes. But that is also, people are different. People walk at different rates, and, and so I wonder whether that could also be a, it might be a long leg or short leg. I'm so glad you asked. That's going to be the, <laughs> let me see, in three slides. <laughs> okay. yeah. So from the trace level, if you consider multiple footsteps and the, the identity, you'll get even higher accuracy. In fact, we get 99% accuracy on the trace level when we have enough training data. Then we conduct a, what we call cookie trial. So because we get such a good data, such good result, we got cocky. We <laughs> asked a student, like, so there's uh, some cookie, free cookie at the end of the hallway. Uh, if you want, you can go grab some. And we record their data. And we got really low accuracy, like 72%, even for the trace level. So we are wondering, What's going on? Like, cookie does not change human footstep, right? <laughs> so, turns out something else changed the human footstep. Same, pe same person can walk very differently when they walk at a different walking speed. And to, to be more uh, precise, I'm going to use footstep frequency uh, for the rest of the talk. It's not the frequency domain, it's more like the interval between uh, time interval between two consecutive first steps. So if you see here, for the, when the people walk at a high first step frequency, this, their striking angle is higher. It's even larger comparing when they walk at the lower step frequency. Furthermore, they strike further, each uh, striking length is further. And the side length also is larger when you walk faster, is that correct? Uh, yes, so if you can see yeah. the second see figure the here, the striking length is also larger. So as a result, as we mentioned, gait will affect the first step induced vibration signal, right? So we do see very different time domain signal when the same person walk at different first step frequency. The characteristic, can you, the feature you can extract is already different. So imagine you train the system, you train the model with the top figure uh, signal and test on the bottom figure. 
of course we we'll, won't be able to identify the person again because it doesn't it's not the, from the same class so we look further into this new dimension the first step frequency by asking one person walking at seven different first step frequency and we collect the data um, at each step frequency we collect uh, 35 first step data and we put them all together apply a clustering based on how similar each signal are and we got in general three different clusters they do look very different right so we further look into how like what's the distribution of these clusters at a different step frequency so if you look at the clustering cluster one it's concentrated on the steps that when the people walk really fast while cluster two happens when the same person walks in the medium step frequency and the low step frequency while cluster three only appears in the like low step frequency so what happened back then in our cookie trial we actually built a model with a medium step frequency and when the grad student meet free food they walk really fast so they get the cookie at the almost the highest step frequency so when that happens of course we get really low accuracy because they already walk different so other than that, another thing that we do notice here is the data distribution change of these different clusters. They change smoothly here. So this, uh, I'll talk about this observation later, but let's look at what's going on, what's a problem in our learning model. So um, traditionally, for, the, uh, for positive or negative data, when we try to classify them, we use supervised learning, we draw a line that separates them best, and then it fails when, when the test data distribution are actually different from our uh, label data set. So uh, overfitting. So a simple solution to overfitting is to actually collect more data, collect, train them all, collect a lot of data that covers all different types of data distribution. As we mentioned, it's a simple solution, as simple as you ask your grandma to walk along the hallway 70 times, different walking speed. So that doesn't work, obviously. We actually look into alternative solution where we find transfer learning or semi-supervised learning, transductive learning, where the learning methods take both label data and unlabeled data into account. Although they do have the assumption when the device learning smoothly with the physical attributes with our step, uh, step frequency. So if you imagine the data distribution here, uh, you can see, um, like you can see the, this is a imaginary um, figure, but you can see the, the step frequency actually um, determines the data distribution the data distribution itself. So with that, we actually can tell whether the unlabeled data here um, like represented with the uh, circles, which part of the unlabeled data can our existing method pre uh, handle or predict accurately? So in, I'm pointing out with uh, um, the red arrows here. So with that information, we can actually learn the entire data distribution iteratively because we know um, this part of the data that we can handle with, a, say, with a um, transfer learning method and the existing label data. Very limited, but it, it's there. So in each iteration, we only handle this uh, similar data distribution that's been determined by the physical attributes, the step frequency. And we are able to get high accuracy in each iteration. 
So at the end of the iteration, we will be able to say, we know it's confidence and we know it's probably really accurate. Why not, uh, why not labeling them with the like, prediction we get? So we select the prediction with high um, confidence and actually consider them as label data in the next round. So with that, with the newly labeled data, our system will be able to handle a bigger data distribution change in the next iteration. So the key here is that we are utilizing the sensed physical attributes, in this case, the step frequency, to determine the order of the learning. So, so that in each iteration, we will be able to, um, we will be able to um, get high accuracy um, with the existing, say, transfer learning method. So we implement our um, algorithm for print ID, and we test it on the data we collect uh, with a support vector, uh, comparing to the support vector machine. So as you can see, if we only have the label data from the medium step frequency, and we test also on the medium step frequency, both the um, support vector machine and our method have high accuracy. But once the data distribution change, say once we try to predict the, data, the first step with low or high data step frequency, the support vector machine uh, has an accuracy that drops significantly. Uh, as you can see, for the extreme cases, it drops to even around the 0.1, um, like 10% accuracy, it's almost as just a guessing. On the other hand, for the first step print ID, we, will be, we see the dropping trend, but we will still be able to predict with fairly high accuracy, even at the, um, the extreme first step frequencies. So overall, the accu average accuracy from our first print ID is a, a slightly um, over 60%, which is okay, but it's not great. So can we do better? We actually stress holding on the decision um, on the confidence level that um, the, our method um, output. And if we consider the, the cases where the confidence level is lower than certain threshold as unknown, we'll be able to increase our prediction accuracy with up to say almost a 90% accuracy. And note that we only use 10 traces each person from the medium step frequency and we're predicting on the entire, all different type of walking speed. So in summary, we are learning with limited labeled, uh, initial label data. And we, um, we are expanding our model iteratively guided by the physical, uh, physical insight, in this case, the change of the human step frequency. We identify people with only 10 traits from the medium uh, step frequency, and we achieve three times accuracy improvement on extreme speed and 1.5 times ac uh, accuracy improvement on the overall walking speed. And as we mentioned, as you mentioned before about how, what happens for different people wearing different shoes. It can be applied for the same technology that expand the model little by little based on the physical insight as we, like in this case, um, the step, uh, step frequency. So we summarize our system uh, where we utilize the uh, human-induced vibration uh, detected by the structure and the sensor on the structure, um, we conduct the signal characterization and learning to finally extract the human information from it. And the key takeaway message here is that we are actually utilizing physical insights from both human and structure, including the wave attenuation, wave dispersion, how gate changes, and the gate is actually the one of the, say, 
biometrics that can identify people, we utilize all these physical insights to assist not only data acquisition, characterization, as well as the learning part. So the application, we, we, uh, our uh, structure as sensor can apply on, including a, a, a few uh, applications here. So the application on elderly care, if you remember, we start our project with hand washing detection, where uh, we, with the detection of people don't wash hands. We actually have a paper talking about not only whether we can detect the hand washing activity, also we can detect the, the nursing or hospital staff, whether they wash their hands properly, whether they apply soup, whether they um, uh, rinsing their hand enough time. So all this can be detected from the vibration caused by the hand washing activity. Furthermore, for the application on the elderly care, we also extract the not only the identity and the location of the people, we also extract their gait balance, where the gait balance is actually an important indicator of the fall risk. So we don't want to, um, say, detect the fall of the elderly. We want to detect before it's happening. We want to prevent the fall. So that's another work we are working on. Furthermore, this type of sensing method are also applied on IoT pairing. So here, we are not only looking at the motion or vibration anymore, we also look at other sensing modality and how the physical insight or the phys physics model that's linking the data um, detected by different uh, um, devices. For example, uh, the home mobile paper is talking about whether we can matching the motion of the IoT device to the motion detected by a smart TV camera so that the IoT device with no interface, uh, only IMU uh, sensor can be connected to the secure uh, network that the smart TV already in through this um, IoT uh, sensing based uh, pairing method. So a few going on projects that we've been working on. Um, this one is my favorite. My advisor told me he is sending me to Thailand. And he actually sent me to a pig farm in Thailand. <laughs> so what we are trying to do here is that the, comp uh, the, the pig farm people, they want to reduce the antibiotics used on pigs. You don't want to let the pig have the resistance on the drugs. You don't want to, like people don't want to eat pork from the pig who use a lot of antibiotics. So we want to detect which pig is sick, separate them, and then use drugs on only on them. So that's a main um, motivation for my advisor to send me to pig farm. And we are still collecting data. The, they, the sensor is actually in the place I don't want to go. Where, like, but um, in general, from, um, from the technology that we use to study human, now we can further study the awareness of the animals. Other than the pig farm, we also collaborate with Aju University, where they have the sensor deployed in the ICU bed. So we want to detect, we, we put our vibration sensor uh, in the ICU bed so that we can detect the motion of the patient and um, predicting when or um, when they want to uh, get up, get out of the bed. Because the nurse wants to know whether the patient is trying to get out of the bed, even they shouldn't. So we are also trying to collect the, as many as much data as we, we can, and we can probably figure out more uh, details on what, the, what patients do in, in their ICU bed. Um, other than that, we, we work with not only elderly, we also work with children. So some of the um, kids has uh, a genetic disease that, like, um, that will alter their gait. We want to detect it at the early stage while the kids just are running around in the hospital through their gait analysis. And we collect the data. We, we are currently asking 
the staff from the hospital to help us labeling them and see what we can get from it. And furthermore, we are collaborating with uh, uh, Shenzhen, Tsinghua Berkeley uh, Shenzhen Institute, and we deploy a sensor in their office. We want to detect the activity and the space usage. And the challenge is there is that they are actually located in a skyscraper with very good damping and uh, vibration reduction system. So we are actually handling really low signal to noise ratio where we want to figure out what will be the best places um, even for that type of building, uh, where can we put the sensor to get the good um, detection results. So in conclusion, when we answer two questions in, um, in terms of uh, acquiring indoor human information. From the system perspective, we are wondering how can we sense better, and we utilize the vibration as a common sensing modality, and we use the structures as sensors to obtain that human information. By looking at the vibration, all the different human activity induce. We study the wave property to characterize the signal so that we can improve the uh, accuracy of the, um, say, localization estimation. From the data perspective, we, we make the system learn, uh, learn more accurately with very limited initial data by, try, uh, by study and understanding the reason of the data distribution change, the physical, physical cause of the distribution change, and um, incorporating the sensing of that aspect into the learning process. Uh, to be more specific, we alter the learning order based on the understanding of the data distribution. So um, that, that's a summary. And uh, I'd love to thank all the um, collaborator as well as nursing home, pig farm, to help us make this come true. The uh, beta group. Beta group. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it was very beautiful, very interesting. Questions? I had a question. Are you, uh, have you guys studied the problem also of uh, detecting, doing your identification with multiple people walking? What, what are the problems there? The more than one person in the corridor walk? Right, so currently we are actually working on paper on that. Um, so the challenge there is the overlapping of the signal. And to be more specific, not only in the overlap, different people, they walk uh, wearing different shoes or different body build will cause different signal, um, signal amplitude. So imagine a very uh, strong signal overlapping with, with a very weak signal. It might completely, uh, over, like completely covering it. So, that's the challenge. And the way we are trying to handle it is we analyze a lot of first step signal and we notice that the onset of the signal has very rich frequency components. By locating that exact window at different sensor, which for, because the, um, the location variation and the, the uh, distance between each step to each sensor are varying, you might have um, even different order of the time um, uh, time arrival for for even different footsteps. So, um, but by looking at that tiny window that contains rich frequency domain, we actually can only use partial signal to further contact with the identification, although with a lower accuracy. So, what we are actually working on right now is to improve that accuracy by considering both the propagation as well as dispersion, say dis the degree of the dispersion, and see whether that information can help us solving this multiple signal mixing problem. You look at, at blind source separation? Oh, we tried. But because the dispersion effect is so severe, oh, yeah. it's actually yeah. making it really difficult. Mm -hmm. Have you 
Yes. So um, that's actually a, a like very depending on the structure itself. So some of the structure actually is more uh, dispersive comparing to others. And for those uh, st structures, um, there's another problem where where um, for different location of the structure, the response, um, the signal response. It's also different. So not only in the where we need to handle the dispersion effect, we also need to handle the severe decay um, problem. So for example, um, if this is if this is a room and there are, uh, there's a particular type of construction wall that will dampen your signal severely. So you want to put the sensor away from that type of structure so that you can have high signal amplitude, while the, um, the dispersion effect is more from building to building the material itself, that we currently we are only in characterize, uh, characterization of the signal and uh, utilizing the particular, um, now we actually can do um, calibration-free um, uh, calibration free, um, dispersion reduction um, on all those uh, structures. Uh, another way to, uh, to approach a problem would be uh, if you know how bad the dispersion effect is, you can transfer the knowledge of similar dispersion uh, structure to this particular structure so that you don't need uh, that much uh, of the uh, sensor as well as the label data to figure out the um, to figure out the, the human information. When you guys started looking into uh, everybody using CNNs now, deep networks, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they the current networks work very well for for transceivers. Have you guys started looking into that? We actually are looking at the RNN, and mm -hmm. we are trying to uh, guide it by designing the op multiple output heads and see whether that can bring out a more uh, physical insight in the neural network. Right. Yeah. Very good. More questions? Yeah. Um, now related to the technical side, but, uh, since you're collecting all these data in the big structure where there's a lot of people, mm -hmm. I wonder if the privacy aspect of these collections ever came out in your research? Well, um, as long as you wash your hand after using restroom, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think people are, in general, people are fine with uh, we collecting this structural vibration, but eventually, say with a, if we can get in more and more detailed information from it, there might be concern raising if the technology is there. Right. I've, uh, I've recently, or maybe last year, I've heard of research from MIT where a student constructed a. Um, algorithm that can transform a video of a, a bag of chips mm -hmm. and convert that into the audio yeah. people yelling at it. Mm -hmm. So I think the technology stuff we hear, we're collecting enough vibration to recreate this, like, the, the situation. Well, I think, I think we're heading there now, for sure. Yeah, in this era, sometimes people say we don't have privacy at all. It's just mm -hmm. the how you feel about it. For example, um, when we deploy in the nursing home, it's more about how they feel about the privacy. And in fact, we, we might not have privacy anymore in this era. Do you have to do an, an IRB protocol for this or not? Probably not. Uh, yeah, we have to do IRB. Really? Yeah. Even if you don't store the names of the people walking around? Oh, we have to claim it has the same risk as people walking without our system. So if you fall while walking during our experiment, it's the same risk as you fall during